It's good to be back, and I apologize a little bit in advance uh, for my sermon today. Uh, we buried my mom on Monday, and yesterday would have been her 92nd birthday, so I still have my parents on my mind a little bit. And so today I'm going to be preaching from my mom's favorite verse, the verse I preached on at her funeral. If you, some of you may have got in on the streaming or were there, so you'll hear a a few of the same things again, but I want to reflect on her favorite verse. And verses 3 and 4 of Isaiah 26, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And before those words in Isaiah, um, Isaiah 25 says, On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that covers all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day you will say, this is the Lord. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And then chapter 26 says, in that day you will say, we have a strong city. The Lord makes salvation its walls and ramparts. Open the gates that the righteous may enter there, the nation who keeps faith. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. When I think of my parents, I do think of peace and strength. My mom requested in writing that this be the text for her funeral, and she said, peace and strength are what we need each day. That was her guidance for the funeral, and then she had six songs that we had to sing, and we had to sing all the verses of every one, <laughs> because she wanted it to be more of a hymn sing. I'll give you a little bit of background about my parents, and I don't reflect on them. I know that that's more personal to me than to most of you, but my hope is that in um, talking about them, it's not so much about them, but what, what Christ looks like in the lives of two, I don't know if you'd call them ordinary people, because I don't think they were very ordinary, but, you know, a homemaker and a farmer. That's, the, that's who they would have identified um, with in terms of the work that they did. My mom was a city girl. Uh, she grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And at an early age already, she loved music and the piano. When she was five years old, she would pull a chair over against the wall and the chair rail between two doors would be the organ or the piano and she would pretend she was playing on that thing. She always loved music. And her verse, her favorite verse is, about a mind that's fixed on Christ. One of the amazing things about my mom was her mind. She was a very brilliant woman. She was the valedictorian of her class in school, and she had a mind that could remember uh, vast amounts of information, everybody's birthdays and anniversaries that she ever met, and lots of other important stuff too, including, of course, the Bible and the words of all the hymns that she loved so much. But in her uh, latter years, her short-term memory went, and so she couldn't remember very much of what you said to her or of what had happened. She could remember everything from more than 10 years ago. That never left her. Her personality never left her, but her short-term memory did. But God gave her uh, a tremendously gifted mind and, um, and a godly family that she grew up in. My dad was not a city person. He grew up on a ranch in Montana. And he grew up um, working on a farm. The Lord spared his life. He was run over by horses and a sickle when he was a boy, and he had a scar on the back of his head the rest of his life. So, uh, you know, if that accident had taken a different turn, um, I wouldn't be here, and a whole lot of other people wouldn't be. 
But the Lord um, spared his life. Um, he went through high school. Um, he was, I believe, editor of the school yearbook, and he was on the basketball team like all um, good boys are. And you know, so that, um, you know, he, and then he and my mom met uh, when my mom went on a trip to Montana to see a friend who was a pastor's daughter out there. And while she was um, in Montana, she met my dad, and one thing led to another. And they got engaged at age 20, but then my dad had to go to Germany with the U.S. Army for three years. And then when he came back, they were finally married uh, in 1953, and they were married for 64 years until my dad's death in 2017. So they, they lived for many years together, brought up kids, um, had grandkids, and, and did a lot of things. Uh, this picture was taken at my mom and dad's 60th anniversary reunion that we had. And I remember my mom, after Dad had passed away, saying, well, um, you know, Dad and I, I don't remember us ever arguing. <laughs> we disagreed once in a while, but we never argued. <laughs> well, whatever the distinction between those two things is, I'm not sure. But, um, but they did love each other. Uh, every day when my dad went out the door, the, they, he would kiss my mom on his way out the door to go work on the farm. I remember at the 60th anniversary, uh, reunion, he said um, to the rest of us, my dad was kind of an expressive guy, he had tears in his eyes, and he says, oh, Mom is more beautiful today than the day I met her. And my mom, in typical fashion, said, Marv, I'm afraid your eyesight is going with old age. <laughs> But anyway, they loved each other for a long time, and then my dad passed away in 2017 and was buried with military honors in the cemetery um, near Manhattan, Montana, overlooking the mountains, and that's the same cemetery where my mom was buried on Monday. And they, they're in that cemetery now. They left a few people behind. Uh, they... At the, that picture was taken a few years ago. I think they now, if you added up the kids and grandkids, you'd get about 50 and then throw in the kids and spouses, you're getting well, you know. I think it's almost like Jacob. You have about 70 <laughs> by the time you add them up at, at the time of their death. So they had the opportunity, um, by God's favor, to have many children and grandchildren, and they left a legacy. And I want to think a little bit about that that legacy of what happens when a mind is fixed on Christ. The Bible speaks about the mind of the Spirit or the mind of Christ. In the New Testament, we know that a mind fixed on Christ is not just thinking about Christ, but is actually Christ Himself implanting His way of thinking into people by the Holy Spirit, where Christ not only is a blessing to them, but actually Christ dwells in and shines from the lives of people whom he indwells. And when a mind is fixed on Christ, and when we have the mind of Christ, then God keeps us in his perfect peace because we trust in him. And a mind fixed on Christ, I want to just portray that a little bit, the way that I saw it worked out in the mind of my parents, I mentioned that my mom had a very sharp mind, but it, the most important thing about her mind was not IQ level. Because, you know, when you lose your memory, you lose certain things, but she never lost a mind fixed on Christ. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That is where this peace that surpasses understanding comes from. From Jesus' gift of peace that he gives to those whose minds are fixed on him. And the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength, or as a different translation puts it, the Lord is the rock eternal. And when you have a mind built on that rock, then it is a strong and steady mind. And I, I think of the strength of my parents and the strength of other godly people. Sometimes it's even physical strength. When you think of your dad, you know, my dad's stronger than your dad. My dad probably was stronger than your dad. Sorry. <laughs> you know, uh, he carried lots of sprinkler pipe. He dealt with a lot of 
cattle of that weighed 1,000 pounds, some of them 2,000 pounds when you're halter breaking, and you've got, to be a little, you've got to have a little strength to deal with that. I remember it was only a few years ago, my son Brian comes to me and looks at me with deadly seriousness, and he says, Dad, is Grandpa stronger than you are? <laughs> I was out in the field the other day with Grandpa, and there was a bale there that I could hardly budge. And Grandpa just took that sucker and threw it. I said, well, I don't know if Grandpa's stronger than I am anymore. He is in his 80s. <laughs> but, um, you know, he, he, he was a strong man. He even had a strong voice. When he was on the phone, sometimes he'd be talking on the phone so loud and gesturing away as though they could see him. Um, my mom would say after he hung up, Marv, why don't you just hang up the phone and lean out the window? Because <laughs> he, he had a, a loud, strong voice. Um, but, but that strength, you know, physical strength or a loud voice isn't really the, the strength uh, so much that comes from the Lord. Uh, maybe I could describe it better in the conversation that my widowed aunts had a few years ago when I was there. I've mentioned this before here. I have three aunts in Kalamazoo and they were all talking to each other. And I was visiting them. They had all lost their husbands by then. And they talked uh, about the fact that they missed their husbands. And then one of them said, but the Lord is so near. And another one said, yes, isn't it wonderful? And here they were, these old widows, missing their husbands, beaming because the Lord is so near. That's, that's the perfect peace, the, the everlasting strength that comes when many other things have fallen away. Well, a mind stayed on the Lord is a strong mind. A mind stayed on the Lord is also a loving mind. I mentioned to you already that my dad said, well, after 64 years of marriage, my mom was more beautiful than ever. They, they loved each other through all of those years. And you might be tempted to think, oh, you know, that's, um, that's nice that some people live forever in, the, in that lofty realm of romance for all of those years. Well, my kids were reading through some of Grandma's journals the night of the funeral. She had books and books of journals that she wrote. And in many of those journals, there was a lot of mundane stuff like washed clothes and this is what we had for dinner and, you know, just lots and lots of stuff like that. One day, she had an entry that had my kids in stitches laughing because my dad had phoned. Um, it was a Sunday, and my, my mom had been a little tired, so she'd gone to bed that night after church. And I don't know how my dad got, was still somewhere. But anyway, she gets a phone call while she's in bed. Um, I invited several people over. You think they could come on over tonight? So, so she gets out of bed and makes a lunch for them. They show up at 20 minutes to 11. That's when they show up after she's gone to bed. And at the end of that, she writes in all caps, Honestly, <laughs> with a couple of exclamation points. Um, long before cell phones and texting, she had little smiley faces and little frowny faces and a lot of other emojis <laughs> in her journal. She was way ahead of her time, although she never did get on the train with the, with the computers and the cell phones. But honestly, you know, there, there are those moments in a marriage where you say, honestly. But... Um, but there was that love between them that always lasted, and that's, that's the loving mind that God gave them. And that love also was directed at their kids. Um, and my mom would often do special things for us. I won't get into all the details of, of all the stuff for, for us. You know, the way to our heart is through our stomach, so a lot of that was just good meals. Um, you know, we had steak every Sunday because we lived on a cattle ranch. And then on special occasions when you were going to get a real treat, you got chicken. Ooh, yeah, that's, we, we eat a little more chicken than beef these days, um, you know, because I don't live on a ranch anymore. But I remember many good meals. I remember um, on Easter, you know, I know some people say Easter is a pagan holiday. Well, I'll let you in on a little secret about my pagan mother. She would make chocolate bunnies out of cake and then dye um, coconut green and then put jelly beans in the coconut so you had these um, bunnies surrounded by Easter eggs. 
And we lived in total confusion. We had no idea that Easter was about Jesus' resurrection. <laughs> well, well, actually not. Um, you know, we were always in church on Easter and every other Sunday, praising the Lord and celebrating the resurrection. She knew what Easter was about, but she didn't mind having a little bit of fun and a little bit of chocolate cake for her kids either. So, uh, be that, you may think my mom was a pagan now, but, um, but she loved to make hot cross buns and, you know, just special stuff for special occasions. And that, those are ways that, that love comes through. And you read about, I did umpteen loads of wash today, and you read that entry, and, and then there's one entry, did more wash today, story of my life. <laughs> the kids were laughing, but I bet one or two of you moms out there well, if you read those journals about, I had to make more meals today, I had to pick up more today, boy, we're having some trouble getting these kids not wetting the bed at night, <laughs> did a ton of loads of wash today, story of my life. But that's what you do when you love people. You just keep doing stuff and serving year after year after year. On the farm, we learn to work and work hard with my dad, I have fond memories of driving on a long road trip to Nebraska to deliver a bull. He weighed well over a ton, 2,400 pounds, and he was perched on the back of a rather small pickup with racks up on the side. So we're driving along the road, and every time he shifts his weight, that, that pickup is dancing. And I'm 15 years old, so my dad has me drive part of the way. Uh, so, you know, when you're a boy and your dad puts, uh, you know, I'm the worst farmer of the bunch, by the way. Um, I can't handle equipment very well. Uh, you know, I always tell people I was probably taken after my mom. I'm not the big macho farmer. But in my defense, I was driving a tractor in Baylor when I was nine years old. And I was halter breaking thousand pound calves, you know, when I was 13 or 14. And I did drive a pickup with a ton bull on the back when I was 15. So, uh, but, but, you know, that's how you learn a little bit of responsibility. You learn work. But I remember just him and me driving all the way to Nebraska and back and just that time that you have together. That's a part of love, too, where you're just together doing stuff together. I remember when my dad called me to tell me that my brother Tim had been diagnosed with Parkinson's in his 50s. And my dad was crying on the phone. And I remember what he said. He said, I wish it was me instead of Tim. That's the mind of Christ. I wish that I could bear the disease instead of him. That's uh, a loving mind. Well... They had that loving mind toward us as kids and toward grandkids, and I commend that to all of you. When, when you're slogging through wash and this and that and thinking the story of my life or doing something with your kids, uh, God is doing things. And when you're washing clothes every day, just remember what God is constantly doing for us, cleaning up, uh, making things clean again on a daily basis for us. When you're struggling sometimes to get meals ready for the family, remember this, God is feeding us every day. How do you think he's feeding us? He's feeding us through you. How do you think that he's uh, providing that daily cleansing? Sure, the, the cleansing from sin that he gives is the ultimate cleansing, but, but the, the work that people do to tidy up and clean up every day is almost a, a, an emblem or almost a sacrament of of how God is providing his cleansing and his reordering of our lives. So don't sell short the expressions of love, of ordinary love that you can show to the people in your life. Well, my parents loved their kids. They loved their grandkids a lot. But they didn't limit it to their own family. My mom, for years and years, had a heart for unborn babies and for women with difficult um, pregnancies and challenging situations. And so she helped to start uh, the Pregnancy Care Center in Bozeman, Montana. It's called Zoe Care now. And my mom was one of the founders of that and worked there as a volunteer for many years. She had a heart for people in prison. When she was um, in her teens already, she would go with my uncle, her older brother, and they would, he would play the guitar and she would play the piano for people in the local jail. 
Uh, when my dad was in his 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, he would drive every week to the county jail about 20 miles away, and then every month to the state prison about two hours away each way. And when people were released from the state prison, he would also mentor them if they were settling again in our area. They had a heart for people who were in difficult situations or who had um, committed crimes and other people might have written off. I remember a couple, um, I remember a couple years ago when I was back visiting Montana, a guy came to me after church and he said to me, um, Dave, your Marvin L. Fettis are saints. He said, I got divorced from my wife and it was all my fault. I committed adultery, I left her. Nobody wanted to talk to me and they came to me and they helped me get back on track with the Lord again. Now, the Bible often calls people saints and they aren't the one or two or 20 people singled out by church officials as the super duper deluxe saintly people, but the saints are the people who have the mind of Christ and have the spirit of Christ in them. And there are people with flaws. There are people who say, honestly, um, you know, there are people who love their kids, but um, also receive certain cards from their kids. The greatest Mother's Day card ever written was written by my brother Tim. He copied it. He had a homemade card and he copied every line from a Hallmark card gushing on and on about what a fabulous mother he had. And he added one line with his own contribution. But sometimes you are crabby. <laughs> now that is a true Mother's Day card. You know, you can go on and on and on about mom, but sometimes you are crabby. Uh, well, you know, there is that that mind of Christ is a loving mind, um, even if it's a little crabby from time to time. My mom and dad had Bible-focused minds. When you talk about fixing your mind on the Lord, it is the word that God has given us that helps us to fix our minds on the Lord. And they wanted us kids to have minds fixed on the word of the Lord, minds filled with the scriptures. And so at every meal, we would read the Bible after the meal, and we'd pray before the meal, then afterward we'd read Bible, and we would pray again. This was so important that it was more important than the meal. When we had to get up early to do chores, and, and then go to the, catch the school bus, if we were running late, they would read Bible instead of after the meal, they would read it before the meal. And then if you saw the bus coming, you grabbed a hunk of toast or grabbed something and ran for the bus because you might skip breakfast, but you didn't get to skip Bible. That's, that's kind of how it worked. And so we learned that the Bible matters a lot from a very early age. I had to laugh because somebody who was, lived nearby us said at the funeral, you know, I had mentioned that in my funeral message, and they came up to me afterward and said, yeah, back in the days of party lines, your mom would take the phone off the hook so nobody called during devotions to interrupt us so we could just listen in on the devotions. Because <laughs> they had, you know, back in the, you guys don't know what that is, you younger kids, but they used to have party lines where several homes were on the same phone line, and if you picked the phone up, nobody else could use the phone, and they couldn't call you either. So that people could listen um, on the party line to those devotions. Uh, another thing that I, you know, very... Interesting thing about my parents, I never heard them say anything bad about a sermon or a pastor. And I was around them quite a bit. They loved to hear the word of God, not just read, but also preached. Now, I thought they might be like me especially well. Uh, you know, I would sometimes, when I was preaching, I would see them out there beaming at me. And I thought, oh, they're very, you know, they're really proud of me that I'm, you know, that I'm preaching. But uh, another guy, after my mom died, he, he was a preacher there, and he says, yeah, I always love to see your mom sitting up near the front with her face beaming while I preached. I thought, well, I guess it wasn't just me. <laughs> but they were people who loved the Bible. Um, they loved a life of prayer. A mind fixed on Christ is a life of prayer. I remember getting up once in a while. I'd wake up early in the morning and go downstairs, and um, I would see my dad on his knees 
before the rest of the house was up, praying. That was how he started his day. That's how my mom started her day. When you see a sign out front, a home discipleship church, that's actually what I'm talking about, and that's mostly where I got it from, was parents who read the Bible and prayed and lived a life of walking with the Lord and, and loving the Lord. And, and a mind that's full of the Bible and prayer is a worshipful mind. I, I mentioned that my mom was already pretending to play the piano when she was five or six on the chair rail in their kitchen. By the time she was 11, she was playing the piano at her school for the singing. She went to a Christian school and she would play the piano and as she got older, um, she began to play the organ. Not without some incident, however. Um, she asked her church, if she could practice on the church's organ, they said, no, we have enough organists. So that was very encouraging. Um, a few years later, they finally allowed her to practice on the organ. And then one day, one of their organists was missing and they begged her, you know, at the last minute to play the piano or play the organ in church. And then she played for another 61 years. Um, she played piano the Monday of the week that she died. I told you her short-term memory wasn't so hot, but she knew every hymn in the hymn book. And the, the week she died, she was still playing the piano for the singing at the retirement home. Uh, she played on Monday and died on Friday. So um, she uh, played basically her whole life. That, that's because she loved worshiping God and helping other people to worship God. It's not just reading the Bible or praying, but, but a but a heart of worship, that's what Jesus says. The Father is seeking worshipers who love him, who worship in spirit and in truth. And that's why she wanted her funeral even to be a hymn sing. I think she may have gotten some of that from her parents and certainly from her mom, my grandma. I remember I was in Michigan attending college and, and seminary. It was in college yet at that time, and I went down to see my relatives in Kalamazoo one weekend, and my grandma was talking to me a little bit. And my grandma was somebody who, whenever she prayed, always would pray the words that I started this service with. Great art thou, Lord, and greatly to be praised. Every prayer she said, somewhere in there had, Great art thou, Lord, and greatly to be praised. And that weekend when I was down there visiting her and it was time to say goodbye and head back up to um, college, she said to me, Dave, always live to praise the Lord. And that was the last thing she ever said to me. Because I went back and I got a phone call a few days later that Grandma had gone to bed and hadn't woken up. Last thing she ever said to me, always live to praise the Lord. When I was little... I don't know if it was for good or bad purposes, but when, when your mom or your grandma looks at you, they, they aren't always sure what you're going to become. Um, but she would say to my mom, I don't know what that boy will be. <laughs> Maybe she's still kind of wondering. But, you know, when you grow up with people who praise the Lord and dream of great things for their children or grandchildren and pray for great things for them, the Lord is going to work His way in the lives of people. And so uh, it's a worshipful mind and, and a mission mind. I've mentioned to you before already that my mom and dad had a heart for people who were um, pregnant and didn't know what to do for the unborn babies, for the people in prison, um, for crusades, uh, tent crusades that were going on and evangelistic outreaches. They were involved in all of that kind of stuff. Um, they... They gave generously, and they wanted to help um, spread the gospel. They were stewards. My, my uh, brother's family would sometimes joke, Grandma is never going to die of natural causes. She's going to get run over by a truck. Because she would go up and down the roads around her house picking up the garbage, and then bring the garbage away. And so she always tended the roads for a couple miles in every direction, from our house. Now we do have a wondrous environmental movement where billionaires fly around on jets um, emitting many fumes to go to environmental conferences, but I, I'll take the person who walks up and down the road and makes their little patch of creation 
cleaner than it was a few minutes ago, or, or my father, you know, and, and farming and just taking care of the land and knowing that that land has got to be taken care of and be um, taken as a stewardship for generations. Uh, a couple days after mom's funeral, I went to the bank with my brother and looked in the um, safety deposit box that they had there. They had the will and a bunch of other documents, and I didn't really need to see it because I, I know he's going to run it and run it honestly. And, but he thought, ah, oh, you should just look at it, Dave. So, so I went down there, and among those, you see a couple of pieces of paper. And one is a promissory note. Um, the Christian school had needed to do a, a project, so there's a promissory note, $50,000. I see another one, a promissory note. The church um, had needed to build, and th there's these promissory notes uh, for $50,000 a piece. And then on the bottom, it says, forgiven. They loaned 50000 and then just wrote forgiven, and that note is gone. Now, you might think, boy, he must have rich, rich parents. Well, maybe they, you know, they did okay. They weren't that fabulously wealthy, but they, they were generous. And I think that that's a good, uh, that is a good picture again of what God does for us. You know, there's this big, big note. And instead of saying, okay, you're going to pay, and you're going to pay, and you're going to pay, just one word, forgiven. Well, um, you know, don't get the wrong impression. Sometimes she was crabby. <laughs> Sometimes he, he did things and we kids would wish that he was different than he was. But at the end of the day, I agree with the guy who said Marvin Nell Fettis were saints. And now having said enough about what the mind of Christ looked like in the lives of of my parents, I want to focus on the real key to all of that. And I want to focus on what it is to have a mind stayed on Jesus, because that's the key. A mind stayed on Jesus' righteousness, his forgiveness, his salvation. That's the first thing. The second thing is a mind stayed on Jesus' daily companionship and presence in your life and his guidance and his help. So the first is what Jesus has already done for us in the past. The second is what Jesus continues to do for us as we walk with him and he walks with us day by day. And the third is a mind stayed on eternal life with Jesus and his great promises and gift for the future. First of all, a mind stayed on Jesus and his forgiveness. The mind that trusts in the Lord you will give him perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ because we're justified by faith. That's what it says in Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that peace with God comes because Jesus' blood pays for all our sins. One of the songs that we sang at mom's funeral was the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We also sang her favorite song, When Peace Like a River. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well with my soul because my sins are nailed to the cross. My dad's favorite song was Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It is that blood, that precious blood of Jesus that paid for our sins. That perfect obedience of Jesus that's credited to us when we know him by faith. And it is because of that that we can know we're forgiven. That we can know that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was my mom who helped me to know that in such a wonderful and full way. When I was nine, and I've told this story before, I, I would cry myself to sleep every night because I didn't know where I stood with God. I didn't know what to think about God. I didn't know what it meant um, for sure.
to belong to him. So finally I went one night and talked to my mom about it. And she spoke to me the words of Revelation 3 verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And hearing that verse, I asked the Lord to come in and live in my life. And I experienced what, what the Bible calls the peace that surpasses understanding, just a tremendous sense of peace and of joy that I belonged to Jesus. And that night, I dreamed of heaven. And I dreamed, I dreamed of the glory and of the angels and the splendor of God. And that was what defined my life was Jesus coming in and a sense of the glory and the magnificence and the wonder of belonging to him. And it was my mom who probably in the course of kind of busy day and um, hectic night, the little boy comes to her and asks a little question. Somewhere in the middle of, did several loads of laundry, story of my life, uh, made a few more meals today, um, popped in at the pregnancy care center. Her little kid asked her a question, and I don't know, do you know what's going to happen? You're in the middle of all this dailiness, and then suddenly heaven comes down and fills your child with the glory of God. And you don't know when that's going to be. You might not even have known, I mean, you might not even have known what happened after it happened. You know, I don't remember uh, if I talked to my mom about it until years later, you know, of what I had dreamed. But you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So this salvation is, first of all, what Jesus did for us in the past. So stay your mind on that. When, you, when you're wavering, when, when you're attacked by the evil one, remember that precious blood and build on the solid rock. All other ground is sinking sand. But my mom's faith and my dad's faith were not just the fact that Jesus did something a long time ago to redeem us and declare all our sins forgiven, but on the fact that he is our companion now. Maybe that's why that verse came to her mind when I asked her was just have Jesus come in and be your friend. And one of the songs we sang at the funeral is a song that she wrote in parentheses on her funeral orders. Um, you know, the title was Jesus is all the world to me and in parentheses she put my testimony. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. That's the song that was her testimony. Jesus is all the world to me. He's my friend. Another song that she picked, of which we had to sing all the verses, um, and this was the third verse. I've found a friend. Oh, such a friend. So kind and true and tender. So wise a counselor and guide, so mighty a defender. From him who loves me now so well, what power my soul can sever? Shall life or death or earth or hell? No, I am his forever. I have found such a friend, and I'm his forever. What can separate us from the love of Christ? In all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what that song's about. What can sever me from God's love? Nothing. And so she and my dad, they knew not just the forgiveness and pardon of Christ and rescue from hell, but the companionship 
of Christ that nothing could separate them from. And then, of course, she looked forward to eternal life with Jesus. Another of the songs she chose was, All the way my Savior leads me. And the last verse says, All the way my Savior leads me, Oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. And the last verse of Jesus is all the world to me. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting days shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life. Eternal joy. He's my friend. When we look forward to the new creation and to heaven, what do you look forward to? You know, you can think of the streets of gold, the splendor of the angels, the wonderful resurrection bodies that we're going to have in their fabulous capacities, the fantastic feast the, of celebration that God has prepared for those who love Him, all the wonders of the new creation. But the best is simply this. I'm going to be with my friend. I'm going to be with, he's my friend. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life. Eternal joy. He's my friend. That's perfect peace. When Jesus is your friend and you know you're going to be with him, then you're not only at peace, you're looking forward to what God has prepared for you. Back when my dad was 74, he had to have a really major surgery and it was not certain that he would survive that surgery. And before uh, they put him under, he said, Well, um, if I live, that's good. If I die, I'll see Jesus. Either way, I win. He had the surgery, and he lived 13 more years, and um, now he lives forever. You, you set your minds on things above, where Christ is. A few years after Dad died, my mom said, Well, how long is it since we lost Dad? Well, I shouldn't say we lost him. When you lose something, you don't know where it is. We know exactly where Dad is. My mom, back when she was 13 years old, had a brother named Andrew, uh, who one day woke up feeling poorly and had pain in his head, and didn't go to school that day. And he was lying on his bed at home with just his parents there, and he was dying. And he said to his parents, my grandpa and grandma, I love you. And then he opened his wa arms wide and he said, I love him too. And he died. My cousin died last year, my cousin Sherry. Um, she wasn't feeling well one day and she was feeling kind of hot, so her husband went to the kitchen and got a glass of water and brought it back to her. And before he could give her that glass of water, she died. She said one word, Jesus. I don't know if she saw him or if she just knew that that's where she was headed, but she only had time to say one word, and that was the word, Jesus. That's the only word you need. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord is everlasting strength. Jesus says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. This is the one we believe in. He is the source of perfect peace. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are.
for all you've done to secure our salvation, for your perfect life, for your suffering, for the precious blood, for your glorious resurrection. And we thank you, too, for your ongoing companionship and friendship, that you walk with us through life and that you live within us by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the future that you have prepared for us. And may we, Lord, live in daily anticipation of that future and live every day in light of the glory that you've prepared for us. We thank you, Lord, for revealing these things to us by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the precious word of God written. We thank you for the great hymns of the faith that express the heart of the saints and your great heart toward us. We thank you, Lord, for the life of prayer. We thank you for the heritage of generations who've gone before us. We thank you for all that we have gleaned and learned from them. And Lord, we do pray also for those who have not been blessed with such a heritage, whose parents were cruel to them or were not helping them to know you, but were an obstacle to knowing you. Help them, Lord, to overcome that and to establish a new legacy for themselves and for their children and for generations to come. Help us, Lord, to follow you as your disciples and to make our homes havens of discipleship and our churches places where we can encourage one another as your disciples, that we may love one another as you have loved us, that we may love those within our families and those beyond our families, those who are still trapped in sin, who are caught in situations of terrible poverty, who are just downcast and struggling. May our lives, Lord, pour out love into them, knowing, Lord, that you have given so much for us. Thank you, Lord, for my parents and grandparents. And, Lord, I pray that each of us here today may recommit ourselves to the legacy of the godly who went before us, that we may separate ourselves from any ungodly legacy that was handed down to us, and that we may be found faithful in our generation and serve the purposes for which you appointed us. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Savior and friend and coming Redeemer. Amen.